All right, so for this video, we're going to be talking about the interwar years for, Doug for Douglas MacArthur, basically 1919 to 1935. Uh, previous video, we went over World War I. But for this one, we're going to start about how basically he became the uh, superintendent of West Point, right? And so the in an interesting thing about this is the person who actually told him to do this, uh, the current, at the time, Army Chief of Staff, was a person named the name uh, General Peyton C. March, who actually served under Douglas's father, um, Arthur MacArthur in the Philippines. Um, so he was the one who actually told Douglas to basically more or less immediately become, or assume the superintendency, if that's a word, of, uh, of West Point, right? And so to take a quote on how MacArthur took it. Basically, he was. Um, he said he's a field soldier. He can't do it. Um, he pointed out that his age was against him. So five of the academy's professors had been on the faculty when he was a plebe, and the current superintendent, whom he would be relieving, was seventy-two. And basically, March was like, "Yes, you can do it. You'll be fine." Sort of thing. Um, to that, MacArthur, it's doubtful that he argued hard. Um, he loved West Point. More important, the appointment was one of the most prestigious in the Army. If he agreed to do it, he would be confirmed as a Brigadier General in the regular Army. If he refused, he would revert to his pre-war rank of Major. He accepted on June 12th. He and his mother moved into the Superintendent's Mansion of Brick and Iron Grill. Right? So to that, he kind of starts to, he gets a, uh, let's say his adjutant, um, I think it's pronounced GNU, it's kind of like GNU, but with a G, um, but anyways, uh, basically goes into a lot of how he, his adjutant describes him, right, in his time at West Point. So since MacArthur was a clean desk man, Every decision was made immediately. Basically, he didn't like his desk cluttered and pretty much made everything, on, not on the fly, but like he had no problems making decisions. So every letter or memorandum answered uh, bef was, be was answered before the day was over. His files for 1919 to 1922 are, from the biographer's point of view, maddingly, maddingly thin. Wow, I can't talk this morning. Anyways, um, so there's that, uh, to continue, um, he clung, meaning MacArthur, um, from his adjutant's perspective, right? So Gnu is telling us, you know, he clung to his principle that rules are mostly made to be broken and are too often for the lazy to hide behind. Basically, that's how, like, he approached his time at West Point. He made a lot of different rules. Um, and changed some things while he was there. Meaning like, uh, I think he, he started to allow the cadets to like smoke. Um, more time on the weekends to go out and go out to town, that sort of thing. Um, a little more lax on that sort of thing. Whereas when he was in West Point, it was completely different. Um, to continue, so letters of reprimand or even telephone rebukes were anti-theme to, wow, anti-thema to him. His contacts were face-to-face. -face. All visitors were treated alike, whether sergeants or major generals. All right. So, uh, Gnu believes that he possessed a gifted leadership, a leadership that kept you at a respectful distance, yet at the same time took you in as an esteemed member of his team, and very quickly had you working harder than you had ever worked before in your life. Just because of the loyalty, admiration, and respect in which you held him, obedience is something a leader can command, but loyalty is something, an undefinable something, that he is obliged to win. MacArthur knew instinctively how to win it. And it's basically like, that's how his entire, I don't want to say his entire staff, but the people closest to him kind of felt about him, right? Um, there's other times where uh, MacArthur wasn't exactly popular with, we'll say, the good old boys club who ran West Point in a way. I think it's the committee or whatever. I'm pretty sure we'll get to it. Um, yeah, just in a second. Right, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, to make another note on like, how he kind of reacted 
um, with his time at West Point. Um, basically, when crossed, he refused to make a scene. With all his high-strung impulses, he held himself in check. And in about 10 words, he summed up a deserved and consummate loathing. Even in reproof and rebuff, he kept his lofty manners of a gentleman. Right? So a little bit of, his, I guess, how he dealt with some of the adversity, I guess, in a way, um, of what he was doing with that West Point. Because as we'll get into, he was not particularly cared for by, we'll say, the old guard or whatever. Um, and part of the reason is to specifically state some of the rules that he gave are changed. So he made it so that uh, cadets could afford ice cream now because one of MacArthur's first innovations was or had been to allow each of them $5 a month spending money on weekends. They were a lot, now granted six hour passes and in the summer months, two days leave, right? And then got really big into uh, West Point football. That was another thing that he did. Um, so to make a direct statement on the people who didn't like him, basically. The uh, Stan Pat alumni, they called dogs, standing for uh, disgruntled old grads, um, protested that MacArthur was introducing a basilisk of pat permissiveness, which would corrupt West Point, basically. And that pretty much sums up how they kind of dealt with him in general for his entire time at West Point. Um, and you see that throughout the whole, his whole time there. But I think six minutes is pretty decent for just about West Point. So we're going to continue a little bit after. Um, also during the interwar years, um, after his time at West Point, um, basically Pershing appointed MacArthur as a major general 10 days before leaving office of chief of staff. Because after West Point, he basically became army chief of staff. Um, he put on his second star uh, for Major General on January 17th, 1925. Um, so that's the date his new commission became effective. And he transferred stateside first to Atlanta, where he toured his father's old battlefields at Kennesaw Mountain and Peachtree Creek, and then to Baltimore. Because remember, his father, Arthur MacArthur, was... Uh, Known, known as the boy colonel in um, the Civil War. And I talked a bit more about that in the first video, which you can find in the playlist um, for all of these uh, MacArthur videos, right? So to kind of sum up this whole time for him, especially interwar years. Um, so these were bleak years for a professional soldier. The era of Kellogg brand, meager military budgets, obsolete weapons, and unglamorous rescue missions amid floods of mining accidents. At Rainbow Hill, the government, oh wow. At Rainbow Hill, the general spent long evenings reading about the pacifist movement. He thought it sinister. He spoke vigorously against it before the Soldiers and Sailors Club in New York um, to di directly quote him. So no one would take seriously the equally illogical plan of disbanding our fire department or disbanding our police department to stop crime. Basically, this, he's making that analogous argument for the military at this time as well. Because, um, you know, World War I at the time was kind of supposed to be the end of it. So there's that. Um, let's see. I have another quote. So, it says, I did what I could. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I I didn't make a note on what this one was specifically about. Basically, it was the court martial of Billy Mitchell, right? Who was kind of, who's, I don't remember if they technically started the Army Air Corps back then, um, but basically he was the kind of, he's kind of, now he's kind of taught as to be the father of the modern Air Force in a way, because um, he, basically he was being court martialed um, for more or less insubordination for being such a big advocate for um, the Air Corps, in a way. There's more to it, but um, that's kind of not the purpose of the video. Just a little bit of background context, I guess. It's similar to what happened to both Eisenhower and Patton, to a lesser degree, with the tanks uh, and the armor stuff in the same time period, 
um, they were such a big proponent for those that they kind of started to, we'll say their behavior and advocacy was frowned upon by uh, the, the higher stars in a way, um, from my understanding. Um, without getting too much into it, like I said, that's not really the purpose of this video. But um, MacArthur was actually on the, uh, I don't know if it's called the same thing for for um, court marshals as it is in like regular courts. Basically, it was kind of like a part of the jury um, or committee or whatever that was deciding everything or deciding his fate. And MacArthur was kind of seen as, he was very quiet and stoic during it. Um, and Mitchell basically didn't blame him at all, but to take a quote for what MacArthur did. So he said, um, I did what I could in his behalf and I helped save him from dismissal. But nine years after Mitchell's death, he wrote Senator Alexander Wiley of Wisconsin that he had cast the sole vote against conviction that Billy knew it and that he had never ceased to express his gratitude. Right, basically like saying that MacArthur was like the sole vote against having him court-martialed in a way. Um, so there's that. Uh, there's more on the Billy Mitchell affair. You can find news stories and stuff on that in other places. Might look, that might be future videos and look into that further later. But there's that. Um, and then kind of the final thing I want to say about the interwar years um, is so during this time period, MacArthur's greatest contribution to the New Deal was in implementing the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Triple C, right, CCC, which put unemployed young men to work in American forests, right? Because remember, this is coming up on or going into the beginning of FDR's time and the New Deal and stuff later, which expands greatly. Um, in later chapters that we will talk about more in depth in future videos, right? So remember, um, the first bit in, I guess, initial videos for this playlist and stuff, or it's basically like a general thing of De Douglas MacArthur. Um, it's coming from his, one of his biographies. Um, this one is American Caesar, um, by William Manchester. So here's the cover, at least the one I have. Right, and I'm going to definitely be going through like other sources and stuff as well, but um, it's kind of just the initial things. With that being said, if you guys want like more in depth on maybe specifics and so on, that's uh, what comment sections are for. Let me know. Um, there's that. I also found uh, a lot of things in the National Archives that I'll probably be posting as well. Um, just haven't like found specifics, that sort of thing. Like found some like news articles and things like that um, that you could definitely um, probably put in like the community posts, that sort of thing and share that way. Um, but we'll we'll figure it out as we go. That's pretty much all this is. That being said, um, I'm gonna leave this one here. If you guys have any comments or whatever, the comment sections are there. Uh, so I'm gonna leave this one here and see you on the next one.